For those of you I haven't met, my name is David Thoreau. I'm the president of the Independent Institute. The Independent Policy Forum is a series of seminars and debates and lectures that the Institute is sponsoring. Uh, we're holding them about two or three times per month, involving many top scholars and policy analysts and authors of books that we think are important. Uh, and we think the author of, uh, authors tonight and their book are very important. Um, as many of you know, the Independent Institute is an academic research institute. Uh, in addition to producing our own books, we have about 130 research fellows right now. We also have a quarterly journal called the Independent Review, which if you don't subscribe, you know, you're just not uh, enjoying life. Um, the Institute was started about 12 years ago and uh, is intended to pursue non-politicized scholarship in public policy. So you'll find the topics that we address will be almost any public policy issue and almost any aspect of government. As in um, all fields of science, in the history of economic thought, there have been numerous economists who have made major contributions to the growth of economic analysis and its, its greater sophistication. Occasionally, however, there have been economists who have made profound insights uh, into economics and extended its analysis in ways that others didn't either think of or think was possible. Such is the case with the work of Gary Becker. Gary's work is probably best known for the concept of human capital. Some of you may have read his book, Human Capital. But he's developed and applied that concept and related concepts to issues far beyond the traditional realm of economics, sometimes surprising and uh, upsetting some people. But it's certainly been, uh, I think, a development that has advanced knowledge in ways that um, we all can benefit from. He's pioneered work in such areas as crime, population, the family, labor issues, racial and, sec and uh, gender discrimination, immigration, and many other areas. Gary has effectively shown that economics is the study of human behavior and is cut through the mush that you'd so much uh, find in many other disciplines and in much of public policy discussion. I first met Gary while I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago. Although I had read uh, his book on the family, which is called The Treatise on the Family and also Human Capital, what always amazed me about him was uh, not only a dedication to scholarly excellence, but a creative intellect that would always challenge those around him. Um, but I think I'm most especially grateful to two other people for, uh, for actually the work that Gary's produced. The first is Milton Friedman, who uh, in 1951, while Gary was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, was teaching a course in microeconomics. And Gary claims that that uh, encounter um, inspired him with the excitement of economics before he had taken economics, but didn't see its unique insight. Um, Gary has also worked with many top scholars, ranging from George Stigler, Theodore Schultz, both of which were Nobel laureates as well, Aaron Director, James Holt Coleman, uh, just to name a few. But I also want to thank another person who was, I think, influential in the work that Gary is doing, and that's our second speaker tonight, Gideon Nishat. And the reason is not just because uh, she is his partner, um, but because she is responsible really for the book we have tonight. Um, if it wasn't for her, Gary probably would not have done the column in Business Week. Um, and he admits that it was her uh, persuasive influence that, that got him to do it, and we're the benefactors of that. Um, as a result of the enormous depth and range of Gary's work, uh, it's touched field people and, and institutions that we wouldn't have predicted. Um, Gary and I were both at a, a private conference at the Vatican a couple years ago. Um, and uh, Gary was, um, aside from the Pope, Gary was clearly the star. <laughs> I mean, there was no question about All it, Gary. that secondary position. <laughs> and uh, I think the, uh, the influence that he brought to meetings of that type um, show the range of importance and influence that his work has generated. Uh, 
the book, The Economics of Life, assembles essays by Gary and Gidi, largely from uh, his Business Week column on a host of economic and social issues. As with Milton Friedman's popular books, The Economics of Life is, I believe, a gateway book for others to enter the world of economics and discover its power and excitement. Gary actually received the Nobel Prize for Economic Science in 1992. He is curr currently the Rose Marie and Jack R. Anderson Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. He is University Professor of Economics and Sociology at the University of Chicago and Research Assistant Associate sorry, at the Economics Research Center at the National Opinion Research Center. In addition to his monthly column for Business Week, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, past president of the American Economic Association, for which he received the prestigious Seidman Award, and he's been a fellow for the National Bureau of Economic Research. I mentioned a couple of his other books. His most recent book, in addition to this one, is a book called Accounting, Accounting for Tastes, uh, published by Harvard, as are uh, most of his books currently. Um, other books include Essence of, of Becker, The Economic Approach to Human Behavior, and The Economics of Discrimination, in addition to the ones I've already mentioned. Our second speaker, uh, Gideon Nishat Becker, is a senior research fellow at the Hoover Institution and an associate professor of history at the University of Chicago, I'm sorry, the University of Illinois in Chicago. A member of the editorial board for World Civilization, she's a member of the Middle East Studies Committee at the University of Illinois, and a member of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Chicago. Her other books include The Origins of Modern Reform in Iran, 1870 to 1880, Middle Eastern History, and Women and Revolution in Iran. So you can see between the two of them, they cover quite a bit of territory. <laughs> so um, the format we were going to use tonight is uh, Gidi was going to speak first for 15 or 20 minutes, and then Gary was going to speak, and then open it up to Q&A from the audience. So I'd like to pre present Gidi as our first speaker. Thank you, David, for your wonderful introduction, including about me. <laughs> um, as David mentioned, I'm a historian, and therefore I will use this occasion to give you some background on how we uh, came to put together this volume. Now, the call to Gary to do the columns for business, we came in 1985. Uh, when he got the call from one of the editors of Business Week, his initial reaction was, no way, I'm not going to do this column. Um, the editor told him, why don't you think about it? And Gary decided, well, he, okay, he would accept that. And then our, our friend George Stigler, who was also like Gary, an economist and economist, tried to discourage him. However, to me, this was a great opportunity <laughs> to, to be able to bring out the lessons of, of the market to a much wider audience. Um, now, you might want to know why was I so interested in this, trying to disseminate these ideas. For that reason, I have to give you some idea of my own background. Um, I'm from the Middle East originally. I'm an American now, but I come from a Middle Eastern background, and I spent my adolescent years in Iran. Iran at that time was a country in struggling with many political, social, and economic issues, inequality, great inequality in wealth, many other social problems. And I grew up feeling very frustrated with not being able, with the inability of society to do much about these social problems. In addition to that, I come from a family that truly believes in the idea of social justice, helping the poor. These were things that in our family go back to the year 680, when our grand ancestor, great ancestor, Imam Hussein, preferred to die than accept injustice. So in a way, this came through mother's milk, if you like, in my case. And not surprisingly, like many other students, high school students of my generation, we all turned to socialism because we thought that was the quickest way to solve society's problems. Then I came to the US to study. I came to college. And while here, my tendencies towards socialism were reinforced 
at Barnard College, the college I went to. <laughs> and you might say, how did that happen? I took a course in Western civilization, and we were exposed to the ideas of Adam Smith, his invisible hand, and Marx's ideas. Of course, our teacher, very, um, very subtly, she, um, she helped us, maneuvered us into seeing the horrors of a selfish society that Adam Smith's ideas would create and how wonderful it would be to have a society that was all justice and equality, um, where justice and equality prevailed. Um, so not surprisingly, my ideas became even more reinforced. Then I became a student at the University of Chicago, a history student. It was at that time that I met Gary Becker. Of course, I had heard a little bit about the horrors of the economics department at the University of Chicago. <laughs> However, during our first encounter with Gary, during my first meeting with Gary, uh, he told me he was not interested in politics. So in a way, when he asked me to dinner, I thought, oh, well, um, that's OK. Maybe I could even do some good. <laughs> so, <laughs> during the evening, um, I told him I was a socialist. I thought he would be horrified. He just smiled. And I spent the rest of the evening trying to convince him of the merits of socialism. At the end of the evening, I was elated because I thought, I've converted one of these Chicago <laughs> fascists. <laughs> of course, it was I who became converted. Through my contact with him, I really learned about the real world or how markets can really help societies. And they can help those sectors of society who need it most. That, and I began to see that the problems in the Middle East, as in the rest of the world, had nothing to do with capitalism. It had to do more with crony capitalism than capitalism. And that if they allowed markets to operate and allow people to uh, pursue their own self-interest, societies can really prosper. And what was wrong with the Middle East and Iran, like those other countries, was the type of governments they had in power. And it was the governments who were keeping people from blooming and, um, and developing. Then after I, so I, I had learned many lessons. And yet, I was, once I started teaching at the University of Illinois, I discovered that the ignorance about markets, the ignorance about uh, the benefits of a central, of a, of a large government were universal. And this was in the 70s and 80s when the Sandinistas were the heroes of many of my colleagues. So, were the, so was the government in El Salvador. And I used to get involved in many heated debates about, about uh, with my colleagues about what was wrong with a lot of the underdeveloped countries, etc. And yet I really didn't make any headway. Though I am glad to say that I was able, or I have been able, through my teaching and exposure of the students to some of the ideas that I have learned, to, to teach them that, uh, that it's central governments or big governments that do harm rather than markets. So I feel very good about that. But nevertheless, um, it was not until the offer to Gary came that I felt this was a godsend opportunity for someone like Gary to show a much wider audience than his students and his colleagues and other economists that markets work. So. The upshot was that I had done some editing. I also had gone to the Columbia School of Journalism. I had done some newspaper work. And then I thought I would promise Gary that whatever I could do to make his life easier I, in writing these columns, I would do. And occasionally, I could suggest columns, et cetera. Finally, I was able to convince him. <laughs> and it has been rough going. It hasn't always been easy to produce a column every month. Uh, we lead a very busy life. We have many responsibilities. We both teach. We travel a lot. He is in great demand. Um, therefore, it's a very hectic uh, to have this additional column has been rather hectic for him especially. And, and has it been worth it? The question is, has it been worth it? Has it really have the columns changed any minds? Have they changed any hearts? Who is to say? I have no idea. But I hope so. Um, however, 
I am glad that Gary accepted to write these columns. My contribution, of course, has been minuscule, and I don't want to, uh, to build that up, but I am glad that whatever input I had, um, that I did make it and I convinced him to do this. And in a way, it has really, the, his, the, the work he has done has, um, has been very rewarding for me. First of all, it has given me an opportunity to learn more from Gary. And uh, because as, as he develops the columns, as I talk to him about it, I'm the lay person who has to really understand his arguments. So in a way, I feel I, every time he writes a column and I look at it and we discuss it and I offer my input, I learn something new. So for me, it has been really wonderful. However, I do not want to only emphasize the selfish part of what the columns have done for, for me. Um, however, I do believe that some of the ideas that Gary has repeatedly mentioned and described in these uh, columns have finally surfaced in some policy quarters. Uh, for instance, the term human capital. Um, it's a term that Gary developed um, and he has made it, um, um, he, he helped develop it. It's become a part of the lexicon. You hear it, even President Clinton, I was, a few years ago he mentioned it. Today everybody mentions it. Um, another idea is the idea of school vouchers, which uh, Gary's teacher, Milton Friedman, and our very dear and um, friend Milton Friedman has um, first suggested. Gary wrote about this several times, and in a way, today, it's no longer shocking to people. It's becoming, it's entering the debate. Was it only these columns, or was it um, that have made it more popular? Um, I'm not so vain to say yes, but nevertheless, I think it's been an important contribution. The idea that crime um, also responds to incentive, um, I think is an idea that Gary has repeatedly written about. And I think it's becoming, it, became, it has become recognized that there is an element of incentive in, in crime, for instance. I think these are important issues, and there are many others that he will be speaking about. And of course, he's the economist, so I will let him um, develop these ideas. Um, so on the whole, it has been a wonderful experience for both of us, I think, but also it has been, I hope, it has been a useful contribution to some of the ideas we firmly believe in. Um, so in the long run, or in the, um, my ultimate judgment on the volume that you have before you is that it has been difficult going sometimes. However, it has been a worthwhile undertaking. And thank you very much. And now Gary will talk to you about it. Thank you, Gidi. Um, there's no doubt that these columns that we wrote uh, would never have been written, as Gidi said, if she uh, did not, at the time when I was certainly uh, going to turn down this request that came out of the blue, since I had never written a single word for a popular audience before the Business Week uh, request came. If Gidi did not keep insisting that I should do it. We could always stop doing it if it doesn't work out. She would help me and um, not only be a sounding board, but um, uh, make many suggestions, topics. But she's done all that. And so um, uh, while the columns have come out under my name alone, it is not generosity on my part at all, but uh, simply an acknowledgment of the great debt I owe to her that the book is published under her names together because she has been uh, clearly a major uh, joint author in this endeavor. And um, so let me express my thanks again uh, for that. Um, I, but as Gidi said, we're happy we did the columns. It's been tough going at times and not all of them will work out. Well, I, what, I, well, what I would like to do here is speak a little bit about the, the, a couple of the broad principles I want 
has tried to convey in these columns, and then give a variety of applications and then have discussion. Uh, three, I think, issues or principles that guide the development of the columns. One is that there's a certain thing that we call the economic way of looking at behavior. And that is very broad and covers, as you'll see, for those of you who have copies and from the examples I'll, I'll give, covers an enormous variety of topics. It's not simply confined to, say, understanding um, the demand for apples or oranges or certain tax policy, although that's an important part of it. But it, it, it goes well beyond that to cover many th uh, subjects that would be called uh, uh, sociological, um, historical, psychological, uh, political. So it's a broad way of looking at behavior. It's a way of analysis. It's an engine of analysis rather than a particular emphasis on, say, material um, uh, possessions or material part of life. So this is not called the economics of material life. It's called the economics of life. A little bit presumptuous, but it tries to convey the idea this is a very broad uh, 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 attack, or attempt to be at least a broad attack on, on many different issues. Now, this engine of analysis has very simple principles. I had a great teacher by the name of Frank Knight, who was also the teacher of Milton Friedman. So, um, and I also had Milton Friedman as my teacher. So uh, you might say it's a very incestuous relationship at the University <laughs> of Chicago. Well, I had Frank Knight toward the end of his uh, career. And I remember him always emphasizing economics is so simple He's amazed that uh, so few people understand economics. <laughs> and it is very simple. And the principles, uh, I think the basic principles are twofold. There are many uh, sub-principles, and I guess they're very complicated in, in application. But the ba basic principles are that people respond very much to incentives. So if you uh, raise reward for some, some activity, you're more likely to find people doing it. And if you raise the cost of punishment, you'll find fewer people doing it. People have, in that sense, this type of rationality that uh, uh, they, uh, not, their choices are not at random. They are systematic. Uh, very simple idea. Some people uh, uh, have, have always, as you'll see in various contexts, objected to it, denied it. Uh, but it's, it's what guides this approach to analysis. And the second idea is that uh, we have scarce resources in society, so there has to be some way of allocating these resources, some kind of equilibrium that emerges. And the great tool that economists have developed is, is the role of competition as a device for affecting what gets produced, how it gets produced, the cost of what gets produced, and ultimately what the incomes of different people are. Uh, we don't always have, you know, a perfect competition, as economists uh, say. It might be imperfect competition or monopoly, but it's the uh, it's the differences between different types of market structures under competitive and less competitive conditions that will determine, given that people respond to incentives, what actually gets done. So these are the fundamental principles, and that's it. And if you understand these principles and have a good feel for these principles. You can be a very good economist, whatever your training is. And there are very good people I call excellent economists who have had little training. As Gidi uh, is an example of that. She's trained uh, by Star and probably maybe has never taken an economics course. But if I had to give her an economic problem, and I had to give some economists who are very well trained and very technical, <laughs> I'd say I'd give the problem to Gidi. She's more likely to come out with the right answer than they, they are. Uh, and there are other examples of that. Uh, some people have a good feel for this. Uh, so these are the principles. Uh, and the idea of the book is to apply them in a short context. I mean, these columns, one of the difficulties of writing a column, like for Business Week, it's very different in that sense from a newspaper column. In a magazine column like Business Week, you have a set number of Business Week lines that you have to write. It's 135 Business Week lines roughly translates into about 790 words. So you have to get everything in that context. So um, uh, George Stigler, 
great economist, one of, was perhaps my best friend, um, said once that it takes an academic five pages just to clear their throat. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> you try to do that writing a column, you go out of business very quickly. If you don't catch people in the first paragraph, you're finished. If you have busy people, uh, they have a lot of other things to read, and you have to have a first paragraph. That's considered the crucial part in a business uh, column, a first paragraph. And then you only have a few hundred other words to write it in. So you have to make it brief. You can't go dot all the I's and cross all the T's. You have to try to get the main points across. And that's what we try to do there. And let me try to uh, take a few examples out of there may be 80 or so examples, 100 examples there, a few of them that convey uh, uh, the breadth of the approach, the potential of, of, of the economic way of thinking to illuminate problems that are, are I think, often confused and uh, poorly understood. Uh, Giddy mentioned crimes. So let me take crime as one example. I was always puzzled. For, uh, I wrote a paper on crime called crime. Just copying Dostoevsky, crime and punishment. Then I added colon an economic uh, an, uh, uh, analysis or an economic approach in, in the late 60s, in which the argument was that criminals respond to incentives too. Criminals aren't there because of genetics. There was a theory in the 19th century about uh, the genetic determinant of crime. And there may be some genetic component, but it's not mainly genetics that determines whether people become criminals or not. Uh, they weren't making choices at random. They were making very systematic choices. I always tell people, say, well, people don't know what the odds are of getting caught. I would say, uh, most of these criminals know a lot better about these odds than you and I do. <laughs> that's their bread and butter. That's the <laughs> people they hang around with. And just like we may know something about what the pay is to uh, professors or to engineers, they know a lot about crime. Um, and they'll respond. And that if you make crime more costly by raising the punishment, uh, either through uh, catching more criminals or punishing more severely, uh, you'll get less crime. Or if you raise the opportunities, the legal opportunities, by improving the quality of schooling, uh, making better jobs available, you will get less crime. So it's not simply a hard line approach to it. It has uh, a hard line, because in the short run, that's the most effective way of affecting crime. But it has, it's a much broader way of looking at it. And the argument made then was that, well, we can deter crime. And yet we saw the crime rate explode in the 60s and 70s. And there were lots of explanations that were given for it. Some of them have some truth to them. But one other thing that was pretty obvious was that uh, we were catching fewer criminals and punishing them less severely. There were many intellectuals who were saying that the crime is punishment. Not that crime is the crime, but the crime is punishment. A famous psychiatrist wrote a book called The Crime of Punishment. Punishment. Yeah, right. exactly. Um, and so uh, there are a few columns in there that, that were written saying, what's going on here? We can, this crime problem is not one of these things that uh, is God-given. We can control crime. Yes, we want to improve the quality of education, and I'll come to that. Yes, we want to make jobs available. We want to give people good legal alternatives. But in the short run, we can control crime, the vicious crimes that affect living throughout the country, especially urban living and schools and the like, uh, by uh, uh, rejecting the ideas that uh, were being uh, perpetrated on us throughout the world by intel uh, uh, many intellectuals, that we cannot affect it. We should raise the probability of convicting people and for serious crimes, give more severe punishments. Uh, well, the message was in several columns. I think largely independent of these columns, let me say, but in the, starting in the early 1980s, we did try to start doing that in the United States. The cost was a sizable increase in number of prisoners, which is uh, regrettable that we had to do that. But the benefits were enormous. There's been an enormous decline in crime in the United States since 1980. It's underestimated because we don't look at the right statistics. The best statistics on that are victimization household surveys, not the police reports. And you look at the victimization surveys, 
you find property crime went down maybe 30 or 40 percent, and, and violent crime went down substantially. There are a number of causes of it, but we now have good studies showing that an important component of it was the fact that we got tougher on crime. Uh, we went back a little bit to where we were in the 1950s. All right, so this is one lesson, very simple one, right? You affect punishment, and, and you have an enormous effect. Now, David mentioned our interesting meeting at the Vatican. <laughs> It was a very interesting meeting, and um, it was a highlight, really, of uh, what, uh, some of the experiences that Gideon and I have had in the last few years, because the Vatican is moving more uh, away from what has been a traditional sort of government socialist approach uh, to a recognition that markets are more effective in combating poverty and misery than governments. Uh, it's not a full recognition in Vatican. There's a fight going on there. Um, I became... Uh, mem uh, elected to the Pontifical Academy of Science a few years ago, so I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a little bit involved in some of this. Um, but I wrote a column, maybe one of the first columns in that book, uh, uh, using the idea of competition uh, in trying to understand religion, in that following sense, understand religion, let me say, in a mod modest sense, in a way, the way it came out. Um, that Religion is, a, is an industry, too, so to speak, an important industry. Religion is an important part of the life of many people. And, um, but do we do better in a religious environment where there's one religion that has a, a government or other monopoly, or do we do better in an environment where religions are allowed to compete for uh, spiritual, so to speak, guidance? Uh, and the argument there was that the uh, advantages of competition apply as well to religion as it does elsewhere, and that the endeavors of each, so to speak, organization to get monopoly applies as much to religion as anywhere else as well. So in many countries where a particular religion gets powerful, they often try to stamp out other religions. They get protected positions, either through government subsidies or through making other religions uh, not legal. And the, uh, the essay argues that religion, however, is the most vibrant in environments where religions compete with each other. The United States is the best example of that. But almost every measure of relig re religiosity, uh, belief in God, attendance in church, and so on, the United States, along with uh, it, it ranks very close to the top. And we probably have the most competitive, if you, if you will, a religious environment of any country in the world. On the other hand, countries like Scandinavia, where there's been a state protected, religions are allowed, of course, in Scandinavia, but the, there's been a state protected religion in the sense that there's been the one religion that has a, 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 a subsidy each year. Uh, almost nobody uh, attends church. And I think there's no accident that in the competitive environment you have a really well-developed, very competitive religious environment, and in the monopoly environment you have a very weak religion. So that essay tries to apply competition to an area that um, many of you uh, might not have thought uh, it, it's so applicable. Another topic that I had, uh, a general area that I've uh, had a fun with in the columns um, is the role of women in the economy, a very important area. She's a professional woman who works full time, and increasingly, of course, women uh, have uh, entered into the labor force and made more and more contributions uh, to the labor force. On the other hand, it's also true that women have continue and have uh, traditionally played a major role in, uh, uh, not in bringing up children and, so to speak, providing the human capital to the next generation. Uh, the most important form of capital in the economy, as I'll come to in a moment, is human capital. And uh, that takes place in schools, of course, takes place at meetings like this, that uh, independent institute, an important uh, force in, so to speak, producing and spreading uh, human capital. But it, it takes place in an enormously crucial and essential way in the home. Okay. Now what's the value of women's contribution in the home? 
But where do we find it in national income accounts? Well, of course, the answer is we don't find it there. Uh, it's uh, national income accounts were developed as measuring activities that go through market transactions. Of course, they're important. Uh, but what about those major forms of activities uh, uh, that do not go through market transactions? What about all the advice that Didi has given me all the time? Where's the value for that in our national income account? I value it. Uh, to me, it's priceless. Uh, but where is its value? The value in, uh, in rearing children and teaching them not only uh, information about the alphabet and knowledge, but values, uh, ethics, that women have played such a major role in. Where is that contribution? Now, you might say, well, you can't measure that. Well, you can't measure it perfectly accurately, but we measure a lot of things that we can't measure. And <laughs> the national income accounts has a major component called the service sector. Most of it, very difficult to measure. But with practice and, and attempts, you do better than when you start. And we can get rough estimates of the contribution of, of women in the household to national income. And I give some examples of that. In, in that column. Now, why is that important? Well, first of all, it's important for getting a better assessment of the total income of an economy. Secondly, it's important in getting a better assessment of the fact that women who stay at home are making a contribution, often more than their husbands are making, who, uh, whose contribution shows up in national income accounts. I think it, it ha will play a role if it had a, a value attached to it in giving women who stay at home a greater feeling of self-respect and contribution that many of them feel instinctively, but since there's no value attached to it, their husband may be making, let's say, 20000 a year. They're really contributing, let's say, 30000 a year, but it's not showing up in anything. So there, there's a, a, a column or two. There are several columns in the book on the role of women, which has been an important interest of ours, but one in particular on how to, uh, why we should modify the national income accounts. Probably the most serious limitation in these accounts is the omission of the contribution that women make in the household. Now, let me take one final example and then we'll uh, have questions. Uh, Didi mentioned the importance of human capital, and that's, of course, been a long term interest of mine. I wrote a book in the early 60s called Human Capital. Um, I didn't invent the name uh, uh, by any means, but uh, maybe the book helped spread it a little bit. Uh, and it's easy to see from simple calculations that if we ask what's the uh, major source of wealth in a country like the United States, it's not property, it's not machinery, it's not equipment, it's the knowledge and skills that people have. It's us, so to speak. It's what we have, uh, uh, rather than the value of the machines. Uh, people have made direct calculations of that, but I won't go into that. But if you just look at, say, the contribution of wages and salaries to national income, it's about 75 to 80 percent uh, in the United States. Most of that is due to the skills, the training that people have. If we all had to rely on simply our physical brute strength, uh, well, speaking for myself, <laughs> I'd be below the minimum wage, that I know. So most of the wage and salary component is the human capital that people have. And that shows up in the, in the importance of having a good public school system, why I've been a strong supporter of vouchers. Uh, I, I think the only way we're going to ever reform the K-12 school system, particularly for people in the inner city, is through a choice in competition, competition working there as when anywhere else. We won't be able to do it simply uh, by um, uh, testing and uh, other criteria that are being advanced. We need the competition that will improve the public school systems as well as bring in uh, private schools into it. The only place where Milton Friedman and I differ on that, and as Gidi said, Milton Friedman is, is a pioneer in the idea of vouchers, that I tend to believe that, we're, uh, that we, really, we really want to aim is for vouchers for the poor to find flexibly and that ultimately move in a direction where the middle classes and others sort of pay directly for their schools, schooling. 
public or private. I mean, they, we all pay indirectly because some the resources have to come someplace. He believes that vouchers should be for everybody. So that's a difference, not a negligible difference, but the notion that you need competition uh, is certainly crucial, and there's no disagreement on that. And um, you won't be able to improve significantly the public schools, particularly for those who need it, who are getting the worst deal now, uh, those at the lower end without uh, uh, some form of competition, and vouchers is the best way to do that. Well, in 1987, uh, uh, I had a column due on a Thursday, and Monday I was putting the finishing touches on a column on, on, un on unionism and why unions were monopolies. And all of a sudden, I, uh, uh, my editor called me from Business Week and said, did you hear what happened to the stock market? I said, no, what? He said, it was down by 22% today. <laughs> I said, so shouldn't you write a column on the stock market crash? <laughs> I said, well, there's not much time left. That's a uh, pretty good idea. Um, <laughs> I said, I didn't want to be the story I heard. Uh, there was a very famous economist by the name of Wesley Mitchell, an uh, expert on business cycles. It was the world's greatest expert on business cycle in his day. And he was teaching a class in 1929 and on business cycles. And he came into class one day, and it was a, the stock market had crashed. And he'd continue to read from his notes, never mention the crash. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, yes, I, sh if I, I, I have this opportunity. Let me write about this crash. It's not 1929. Business Week was then coming out with a cover story saying, another Great Depression, question mark. Well, I, my column said, and it's in there, uh, there's not going to be a Great a Depression. And why? I said, yes, 22% decline in the stock market's a lot. I had an estimate of what it meant for total, uh, how many trillions were lost. Uh, I said, but look, uh, human capital is the bulk of all our wealth. There's no evidence that the valuation placed on human capital has been much affected by this. So this big effect, this 22% decline in stock values, is probably only, it is, and I gave some figures, I don't remember them now, a few percentage decline in total wealth. That's all. It's going to affect the demand for some luxury goods because the people who own stock, particularly in 87, were mainly wealthier people. So the demand for expensive cars are going to go down. Art, paint, the art market's going to be affected uh, some. Uh, trophy homes are going, uh, market is going to go down. But the basic economy isn't going to be much affected by it. Um, I think it came out in the same issue as Business Week's <laughs> cover story that we, we may be in for another 1929. Well, we didn't have a, a, a crash. In fact, uh, a market, an economy crash. If you look at uh, economic statistics, you can't even detect the effect of that stock market crash. Now, let me caution by saying we economists are very poor at short-term predictions. And this is one of the few ones that I got right. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not claiming uh, I can tell you what's going to happen. Uh, but. What I w I'm illustrating that is not the quality of the prediction, but the fact that uh, recognizing the importance of human capital, uh, I think, led me in the right direction and led Business Week and many other people at that time in the wrong direction. Well, I'll just conclude by saying I uh, hope you read the book. There are many <laughs> other examples there. Uh, the examples, in a sense, try to make economics fun to some extent, as Gidi said. I try to make it fun in, discuss in discussing a lot of topics, uh, not always successfully. Should we have marriage contracts? What would be the consequences of that? How should we reform divorce laws? Should we go after fathers who don't support their children, uh, who have child support payments that, uh, that are due? Uh, what about the greenhouse? effect. Uh, what sh should we take it seriously? And if so, what, should, what, if anything, should we do about it? Is population a big threat for, for the world or, or not? Um, uh, Cuba and Taiwan were similar in 1959, both islands, small islands, pretty well off. Uh, why are they so different now? And, uh, and so on. So we had a lot of fun. I hope uh, those of you who read the book uh, have it too, and um, in particular, I hope you see 
that there is a way of looking at a lot of behavior that is simple, doesn't need a lot of jargon, and that uh, it can throw a light on a lot of problems that are, are often um, uh, misunderstood and uh, public policy uh, goes in the wrong direction. Thank you. So, um, uh, Gary and Giddy, if you want to field your questions, or I'll field, field well, them for you, whatever you want. Um, how about Peter? You want to? Um, you mentioned early on. Yes, I'll field them. I guess. Yes. I'm just wondering what economic incentives is Saddam Hussein responding to <laughs> that he continues to pursue policies the kind of policy, the, 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 the sanctions and, and, and the rest. I mean, it's an intriguing idea that he and other dictators might actually be responding to economic incentives. And I have thought about the problem, but I can't quite figure out what incentives they're responding to. Uh, well, I think his main aim to become the leader of the entire Arab world. He's an old-fashioned dictator in the style of some of the uh, classical Middle Eastern or Near Eastern rulers. And he believes by defying the West, uh, he will gain this big, big uh, glorified position of becoming the Nebuchadnezzar or Harun al-Rashid of the Arab world. He want, that's really what he's trying to do. And he's still young enough. He's about 60 years old. And um, the, the problems that have been inflicted on Iraq have not affected him. He is extremely wealthy. And uh, the bombing that, again, that is being directed at Iraq has not hurt him in the least. Um, so in a way, um, I'm not sure economic incentive will work. And he feels that time is on his side. Already, Clinton will be the third president who tried to get rid of him and hasn't succeeded. So he feels maybe with a little bit more time, uh, he will be able to achieve his goal. That's, I think that's probably how he views the situation. I don't know if that makes uh, sense to you, but that's really his goal. Yeah. Uh, I'm Mike Haggerty, Haggerty, University of California, Davis. Uh, both you and Gidi have said that uh, you're interested in changing the minds and hearts of people through this. this and uh, I think you have changed the minds and hearts of many decision makers but not so much of the regular people in the, in the U.S. And uh, I've been tracking quality of life as perceived by people in the U.S. and in European nations. Actually, the, uh, the uh, National Opinion Research Center, of which you're a member, runs the general uh, the social survey, been evaluated, asked people questions for the last 25 years. Has your life been getting better or has it been getting worse? 60% of people say it's been getting worse, which has surprised me. Uh, similarly, uh, tracking the quality of life shows it hasn't improved much in the U.S. Uh, as judged by people's perceptions. It has improved in some European countries like Denmark and Italy. And so my question, do you think the decision makers have moved so much to increase the incentives, which is valuable, at the top, but they aren't increasing the mobility at the bottom of our society? Would that be one? Well. Two questions. Number one, do you agree with that, th whether people are being more satisfied? And number two, what do you think the reasons are? Well, satisfaction is a, you know, and particularly how people answer questions about satisfaction is a difficult area. And the reliability of a lot of this uh, is, is a, a great uncertainty. There are many, by certain objective measures, people have certainly gotten much better off in the last 30 years. And by other measures, not so. Uh, life expectancy, health, for example. Um, if you look at people starting at age seven, uh, at older ages, say 75, there's been an, an enormous and pretty linear increase in their life expectancy for the last 20 years. Um, and they're generally healthier than they were in the past. Now, it's true, we have a dumb policy in the United States, as do all European countries, that while people are getting uh, healthier at older ages and living longer, we're giving them more and more encouragements to leave the labor force through the way we structure Social Security. There's scarcely anybody in Europe who works over age 60 now. The United States is a little better than that. In Italy and Belgium, there's scarcely anybody who works 
over age 55. Um, so, uh, but that, that measure of quality of life is objective, and there's no question that it, it's, it's improved uh, substantially. Most dimensions of, of pollution have, have, are a lot better now than they were uh, in the past, and that's uh, significantly improved. Now, the one area, uh, I mean, more than one area, there are other areas where the picture is, is less good. If you go back, let's say, to the uh, 50s, crime is higher. But crime is a lot lower now than, as I mentioned, it was in 1980. It's much more livable in most major cities now than it was 20 years ago. And New York City has had a revival, largely based, in my judgment, on the significant decline in crime. But that's not a, a Giuliani takes credit for, and he may have done, a, you know, particularly relative to his predecessors as mayor of New York, uh, a, a very good job in attacking crime. But the decline in crime may be greater in New York City is, is a national phenomenon. So that's a, a lot better. Um, one area where things are uh, maybe only modestly better, uh, among the lower skilled individuals, less educated people, their earnings haven't risen. Real earnings haven't risen much in the last 20 years, although there is a problem of how we, you know, deflate money earnings by the price level of the people. Uh, you're an economist, uh, so you know there's the differences of uh, some controversial. But certainly what is true is their earnings have grown much more slowly than that of the more educated people. That's why it's, it's uh, how much more important it is to improve the quality of the schooling of people at these lower levels. And I think that's a way of uh, making them feel that they have done better. If you look at welfare, well, welfare rose a lot in the 70s. It was flat in the 1980s and has fallen and then rose a lot under the Bush administration until 1993 and has fallen a lot since 1993, partly because the economy has done better and partly because the Welfare Reform Act of 1996 has had a significant impact, actually, on the number of people on welfare. So we have about 2.8 million families on welfare now. It peaked at over 4 million in the 90, in 93. So that's a, an area where we've gotten better. So I think, overall, things have gotten better. Uh, it could still be better. I think, you know, there are in many areas of educational policy uh, where we could be doing better. We could have been attacking crime and still be attacking crime um, much better. In some family uh, areas, we could be doing better with uh, divorce laws and marital contracts and so on. So some people are clearly worse off. But I'd be uh, dubious of accepting uh, any conclusions that the American, the typical American is by all the uh, dimensions, not strictly monetary alone, but the overall dimensions are worse off now than they were uh, 30 years ago. I think they're generally better off, but there are some exceptions to that. I think yeah. I have something to say on yeah. this topic as a former journalist. <laughs> I think many. Of, I think one of the things that's also been has happened is that many people who today write for newspapers and the media are the generation of the 60s. I was a student then, I was active in some of these fields, and many of, of the people who are today doing this kind of work, they believe that the bigger the government, the better off are the poor. And therefore, any time there's a movement towards any, let's say, relaxation of government control and greater market activity, they begin to sound the alarm bells. They interview people who are the worst, who have been hurt by this. And this really reinforces the fear that some people may have, oh, things are getting worse and not better. Because as Gary said, if you look at this 30-year period, things have improved enormously. Yet the general perception is that things are not really as, as good as they should be. And I think the press and the media, the television plays a very big role in this. And then they create mistrust of big business and all kinds of other things. This is why we have problems like Bill Gates's problem. Instead of being thankful to somebody like him, we're trying to destroy his company. So I think this has something to do with it, too. Pardon? There's an economic explanation to this. The article, I don't remember if it was in the Harvard magazine or in some of the papers put out, but the argument goes something like that the economic opportunity 
people who were, in fact, in school in the 60s and had these liberal ideas are vastly increased, of course, if government is bigger because they're the kind of, of people who go and fill those jobs. Right. And so they have a clear self-interest. Of course, in, they're a big interest. Yeah. In, Absolutely. In, in promoting like policies which Absolutely. increase their economic opportunity. Right. So it makes Absolutely. perfect sense. Absolutely. That but they would... I think they do play a very important role because of their self-interest in, in creating alarm any time things begin to, to change. Because it's amazing that they always find one family that's been hurt. You see it on every television channel. You see it on the first page of the New York Times. And well, bad news is the grist, as you say, for the media. I mean, so, I mean, if you had only good news, yes, most of the newspapers I would be out of business, I'm afraid. That probably explains why people don't feel the improvement. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, here's you wanted the mic, Mike. The question I have is, the um, even when good things happen and people observe that good things are happening, there seems to be a disconnect in the media as to the cause related to the effect. So that even when, for example, your crime goes down, there's very little discussion of, of the, the reasons for that. So people don't learn right. and, and therefore right. seem willing to accept right. the right. Right. Well, it's the not only people. poor uh, little discussion, there's misunderstanding. In a column about a, uh, six months or so ago that's not in this collection, um, I had a, a, a um, the headline from a New York Times article. Uh, this was a column on crime and saying why that imp the growth in number of prisoners has been an important factor in reducing crime. In the New York Times article that I referred to, the headline was, um, why is it that uh, crime is continues uh, to go down, even though the number of prisoners is up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, uh, the notion that there's some connection between bringing more people in prison and deterring crime di didn't occur to the journalists. So, you know, there are two separate issues, and Nagidi and I sometimes differ on this. Uh, one, to what extent can does somebody writing an article understand what's going on? And you know, they may not uh, be, um, that's difficult. The other issue, to what extent is the press biased uh, against <laughs> markets and so on? Um, and Gidi is, is believes strongly the press is biased. I, uh, and there's no doubt that most people in journalism feel are, li are, are liberal, not in the, uh, European sense of liberal, <laughs> but in the American sense of liberal. Uh, but I've always felt, and that's where we may disagree a little, that a good journalist is more interested in getting the story right uh, than in promoting the particular ideas. Editorial staffs do that. Um, now, how true that is, uh, <laughs> that's where we differ. Uh, uh, competition helps us in that regard. Um, it may not be a, a perfect solution. But I think often the issue is that the journalists are trained by the same people who train who, every, most others, and the people training them don't understand the way these things operate. They don't believe that there is deterrence, and so the journalists don't believe it. Uh, it's not that they're you know, trying to foster something on us necessarily. Uh, the, the teachers don't believe it, and then uh, the whole New York, you know, intellectual uh, crowd, uh, in the tr traditionally hasn't believed it, and, that, uh, and so it's it's my belief. Maybe it's too generous. That's it's more frequently an indication of their lack of understanding than the fact that uh, they have some ulterior motive. But the lack of understanding, and there we do agree. Uh, uh, does trans, uh, transfer to the issue that most of them have still accept the notion that big government is more often the solution rather than the problem. And um, they believe that. And so if they look at a problem as best they can, they'll see it as an indication, well, maybe the government isn't doing enough and it isn't doing the right thing, uh, rather than understanding, which often the case uh, we think, that it's the government is doing too much. And so when, you know, they'll often lament if there's some kind of difficulty. I remember in the city of Chicago, there was a conflict between the mayor and the 
city council, so not much could get done. And they would amend, look at this inaction. Of course, we would all say, great, you know, <laughs> we fewer opportunity to do any damage. So I think it's more misunderstanding rather than somehow ulterior motives. But that's a, it in either be case, both. yeah, it it's may be both. A yeah. both. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I was interested in your concept of accounting for domestic transactions in the national um, income accounts. I, it, I, I can't make intellectual sense of it, and I can't help thinking, if I go and, and microwave a bag of pizza for myself, a, a bag of popcorn for myself, all that happens is I get popcorn. But if my wife uh, goes and microwaves a bag of popcorn for me, the, the national income account goes up by a dollar. Should, well, should we just spend all our time microwaving popcorn for each other <laughs> rather than for ourselves? So to well, sort of pump up the economy. So <laughs> well, the old story used to be when a man married his housekeeper, the national income went down. Uh, <laughs> now, now his wife may go out into the labor force, so that isn't quite as good an example. But yeah, but the national income accounts is. Uh, we've said is uh, very imperfect and many imperfections in them. And I think this, the whole omission of the household sector, I, I stress the role of women because women have been so important and still are so important in the household sector despite their heavy labor force participation. It, the burden of women nowadays is they work a lot in the labor force and they do most of the work in the home as well. And uh, that is a, a conflict that we haven't yet fully uh, understood. Uh, but that's a major omission in national income accounts. Um, and people have estimated, well, how much increase in national income would we get for the United States? Uh, the estimates, I think, in that column are uh, from Robert Eisner, about 20%. Are, uh, there are various ways. There are two ways you can estimate this. Uh, one is you can sort of try to figure out what these people, let's say the women who are not working in the marketplace, would be earning if they went into the marketplace. And the other general way is to try to figure out what it would cost to buy that service instead of having it done in the household. They're not the same methods, they don't always give the same answer, but they give you a rough approximation about how you would want to go about doing it. And both of them suggest it's a very big factor. Uh, there's no reason why we couldn't begin to improve these accounts. In fact, there are several studies, like the book I mentioned by Robert Eisner and John Kendrick and by others, who, have, who show how they can get estimates of a, a much broader set of accounts. And the, now you might say, well, what's the role of doing that? Well, there are many different purposes of doing that. Uh, one is, uh, I think, for, uh, for women who, who want to spend their time uh, raising their families or whatever, it gives them a greater feeling that they're making a significant contribution to national income. Um, and that they can point to, look, I'm, I'm worth more than my husband in, in, in terms of what I'm doing. Another uh, area is it gives us a better assessment of what's happening to not only levels of income, but changes in income over time, the growth rate. You know, we estimate the growth rate. Uh, just a little analysis of that will, will, will easily show that we have a, lots of real biases in uh, the estimate of the rate of growth of national income. And, uh, and one of those is due to the what's going on in the household sector. And there are many other reasons why it, it, it's an important issue. So um, I think it's important. It could be done. Uh, there's no reason why it isn't being done. And it's, um, it's just uh, you know, a tendency to stay with the set of accounts that we are experienced and have. And it would be much harder work to try to derive these new accounts. But uh, we hope it will eventually we'll, we'll move in that direction. Oh, here. I have a question concerning the human capital piece and education. When you look at, I guess, the, the student population today and you, and you think that their educational levels are, are somewhat less than, you know, past generations, and then you look forward into time, and as, as the baby booms start to retire, there, there tends to be a gap of productivity. Could you elaborate on, on what that may mean for the United States in terms of future productivity and wealth creation and generation? Now, maybe, let me get a little clearer view, though, of exactly what you're saying. Um, in terms of the levels of education or the quality of education? Well, the, the quality and quantity of education of the people that are going to actually go into the 
okay. go into the workforce. Yeah. If if you have to do so much remedial right, education of of the coming, you know, the students coming behind us. Absolutely. There's going to be a gap because those people that are in the workforce now are going to retire. So the human capital element may wind up being less than what it is now. So what does that do to the marketplace in the future? I think the U.S. does a good job in educating its population up to about 75% of the population. And this is sometimes misunderstood in international comparisons because what they do is they compare people with the same years of schooling. And I have, have argued that the right way to do it, particularly for productivity comparisons, is to compare people who, who sort of speak when they enter the labor force. And we, we have a very different educational structure in Europe. We sort of build up, you know, gradually. Uh, our universities are generally harder than most of the universities in the rest of the world. Our secondary schools are easier than most in the in Europe and in, and in Asia. And what I'm saying applies to Asia as well as Europe. So we did it in when people entered the labor force. We may still be look behind, but not nearly as much as if we do it by measuring people at age 14 or 16. I think for the top 75%, we're doing a good job. We're doing a very bad job at the bottom 25%. Okay? Now, the of that will be, of course, it's going to affect the productivity of the and has already affected the productivity of the economy, the motivation of the people getting this education, the, uh, whether the, the, the trade-off they make between going into selling drugs or going into um, other activities uh, or other crime activities, um, the uh, marital prospects, I mean, a whole host of economic, social, and political consequences. Uh, and therefore, I think our very high priority has to be to try to improve the education of this fraction of the population. And in, I mentioned vouchers before. Let me add one thing on vouchers. I have suggested that we should have vouchers not simply for people who go to, say, secondary school or elementary school, but those who don't like school. Uh, and drop out, have a voucher so they can get training at a company for a year or two after they drop out. Because we know that most, all of us, when we finish school, we're not really ready to work very efficiently. The uh, industry does a lot of the investing in human capital. Unfortunately, the people dropping out of high school got a very poor high school education and don't have an easy access mm -hmm. into any training program. Uh, so. Um, I would extend the voucher concept uh, to go beyond school uh, to training more generally to include company training. And I think uh, by doing that, we can begin not to fully cure that problem because some of it's due to family structure, it's not just due to the school system, but a lot of it is due to things that are correctable and this would be a way to try to correct that problem. Yes? Well, some people in the back. Mathematical nature of economics. On the one hand, uh, so many articles I see uh, uh, don't seem worth the reading by the time I get to the end of them and, and look at the massive assumptions that were thrown in there. And then uh, on the other hand, there are many, many articles which seem to start with some preordained conclusion and uh, just fool around with that. that um, that hypothesis for 20 pages. You want to handle that one? Please? No, <laughs> that's your area. <laughs> well, uh, it's not the mathematics that's the problem. It's the economists doing the mathematics. Uh, and I, I mean that. Uh, if you go back and you look at the non-mathematical literature, when I was a graduate student, most of it was non-mathematical. There was a lot of confusion in that literature, too. A lot of bad economics. Uh, mathematics, appropriately used, can be a useful tool. Badly used, it'll be a source of confusion. Uh, and I would add two things to that only. Uh, there are scarcely any ideas that cannot be stated in words in economics and, and stated simply. And I, th I think it should be incumbent upon everybody who writes an article, no matter how mathematical, 
to state the basic uh, thrust of the analysis in words so that people can say, is this trivial, uninteresting, or is there something important that seems to be done here? Uh, and secondly, uh, I think most people in, in the profession, you know, have to make their judgment about whether the person doing the mathematics is working on an interesting problem or is working on something, you know, completely uninteresting. So I agree with you. A lot of the mathematical work is, is terrible, uh, uh, completely uninteresting. But a lot of the non-mathematical work isn't any good. <laughs> you know, so uh, as, as somebody, well, I, I was uh, uh, sort of a joint major in mathematics and economics when I was at Princeton. I had took a lot of mathematics. Uh, I'd be considered one of the less mathematical people nowadays, uh, in my department certainly, but I was never afraid of mathematics because I had a lot of mathematical training and studied with people who are much better mathematicians than the, the people in economics are. They're not very good mathematicians typically, and they shouldn't be. They're economists, um, uh, and they're not mathematicians. So I, I, it never intimidated me. The problem is a lot of people don't have much mathematics, get intimidated by the mathematics. Uh, and uh, which is unfortunate. Solution for that, I think, would be to require every article, as I said, to repeat, every article to have a sort of non-mathematical summary. Um, and then people will make their judgments and let competition range. I think mathematics can be a useful tool. There are things you can state better mathematically than you can state in other ways. And, it sh and we shouldn't, have, you know, it's just like saying, well, a physicist shouldn't use mathematics. We, we, we should be able to use mathematics. but. That doesn't deny that a lot of it is junk and a lot of people don't have any good understanding of the economic problem. We have to, you know, we, there has to be a sifting of, of that. So it's not the mathematics per se, in my judgment, although it's often badly used. Uh, I wonder why you would, you would like to discriminate uh, among people on the basis of their income levels. Uh, when assigning vouchers. I was hoping in the previous uh, comment you made re regarding uh, human capital, you'll take the opportunity to clarify your disagreement with uh, Milton on this. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you why. I, I believe that people with the financial means should have to pay for the schooling themselves. They shouldn't get it from the government. Uh, you see, uh, an overall voucher system is a complicated system where you first tax people and then you give it back to them. I would say uh, for people who have the, the means to pay themselves, why tax them in the first place? Require them uh, uh, to pay it. Uh, re uh, you may have public schools, we'll let them charge tuition the way state universities do now. There's no con contradiction between having public as well as private schools in which they charge tuition and they would pay the tuition, and it wouldn't be this complicated structure. We don't suggest there should be vouchers for people at higher education in the state system. Uh, at the uh, lower income levels, uh, it's, a, it's a question of trying to ensure that people come out of poor families uh, should have an opportunity to get, uh, uh, let's say, through a high school education at, at state expense. That would be, that's where I would support the vouchers. At higher education levels, I think they should have to take out loans if they want to go on and repay them later on. Um, so uh, I find an overall voucher system may be uh, a, a good way to sell it politically, and this is what Milton argues, uh, but in terms of where we want to go to, I think we want to go to a system where people of the middle class and the rich pay directly for their schooling, and we only support the people, the children whose parents don't have the means to support them. That's why I would concentrate on that. Now, in fact, the poor education in the United States is at the lower end. So if you're saying, well, where is the real problem? You see, the, I can give you other more complicated economic arguments. The middle classes, they move with their feet. They don't like a school system, and they can't afford even a private school. They'll move to another community. And there are lots of communities competing. There's a very good economic analysis written on this competition among local governments. That's why a lot of us who are European-type liberals prefer small governments and local governments rather than big governments, because you can move across these local governments. Um, the poor, again, have that option much more constrained. Uh, usually they're stuck in the inner city or in a rural area. They, they can't move. They have a monopoly. The rest of us don't have such a monopoly. That's where the problem is. The solution is to concentrate on that as far as I can see. 
and to try to get straightened the tuition payments that the other families have to make rather than going through this convoluted system of taxation and then that. Dee, did you have something No, no, to well, that's okay. I'm no, why don't you say it? Well, I just <laughs> wanted to say that I'm very involved and I really support the voucher movement for the poor because I believe we have an urgent problem in this society to help. We have 25% of children who are not getting the education they should get. And if we try to broaden it, I think it's going to take much longer. It becomes too complicated. Because it's of its urgent nature, I think we should try to address it right away and create this voucher program, and it would be easier to carry out if it's a smaller group rather than just everybody. It would be, we won't have to overhaul the whole educational system. So I think practicality would uh, mandate that we limit it to probably the, the worst off at this stage. Maybe later we can make it change the system, but I think at this stage it should be the, the ones who really can't afford it. That's my opinion. Too. One more question? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to choose bid for it. That's where you come. <laughs> <laughs> you pick, you pick, David. Uh, in the back. Eighty-seven. I'd like to know what your uh, thoughts are. That uh, now, now, now that the Dow hit ten k, and what's going to happen at Y two k? There's no accident why I said that was one of the few good forecasts I had. Uh, I did write a column, and I'll just about. To, I'm not going to try to forecast. I'll be sued if I'm wrong. Um, but I did write something. What was it about a year or so ago? Attacking Greenspan's statement about ir irrational exuberance. And my statement was that I don't know whether the market's too high or not, but I, I know that Greenspan doesn't know either. <laughs> uh, and that uh, if, when we were looking at the price-earnings ratios that we had at that time, I, I cited some data that there were many times in the past when we had those price-earnings ratios where the market continued up for quite a long period of time. Um, so I think it's very dangerous for, uh, to, for, to try to forecast. I mean, we have to do it on our personal portfolios. I'm not getting out of stocks. I'm heavily invested in stocks, and Dee does her own investing to some extent. She's heavily invested in stocks, and she claims she, her record's better than mine. I think she's <laughs> right about that, too, in fact. Uh, uh, but, you know, the price earnings ratios are at very high uh, values now. Now, there was an article today in the Wall Street Journal by James Glassman, who claimed that the market will go to 36,000 rather than 10,000. I don't have that much confidence in his reasoning that there should not be a risk premium on owning stocks rather than bonds, was his argument. If you take away that risk premium and keep interest rates the way they are now, that it'll go to 36,000. I wouldn't bet on it. I, I don't think that's right. Uh, on the other hand, whether the market correction uh, has not been simply correcting an excessively high risk premium in light of current that by risk premium we mean the differential the average return on holding equities and holding bonds um, over the long historical times it's very well documented that you got about five or six percent <coughs> percentage points more by holding stocks and holding bonds that's well documented right the usual explanation we economists give for that is it, that's the premium you get in because stocks are riskier. And in some sense, stocks are riskier. Not against inflation, is what Glassman would argue, but it's another reason that bonds are first priority on the assets and so on. So uh, I think there's always going to be a risk premium, whether it's going to be you know, less than it was in the past, so these new evaluations make some sense. Uh, it's very hard to know, though. I think the one thing we do know is that economists have been very poor in making predictions about future stock markets. On the other hand, we also know there have been bubbles in stock markets. And the Japanese case is a good one. Not on the stock market and property values and foreign exchange and so on. There are a lot of unexplained fluctuations that don't fit in very neatly with any simple model of efficient markets and so on. So that's the caution. Uh, maybe we are on part of a bubble. On the other hand, the, the optimistic side is that most predictions in the past uh, haven't been worth very much. And Greenspan is uh, 
That is, it's no longer talking about irrational exuberance. <laughs> and uh, even Buffett is taking a more, you know, uh, optimistic. So I think it's very hard to know. I mean, the, what, the prudent behavior in most of these things is to, you know, try to have a, you know, I think Ms. Weir Finance Theory is absolutely right. Have a portfolio of some balance to offer you some protection against, uh, against downward pressure. That's the prudent behavior. Beyond that, uh, uh, I'm not going to venture any prediction about what the future of the <laughs> stock market is going to be. I want to thank our speakers tonight, uh, Gary Becker and Gideon Nishat Becker, for joining with us and uh, educating us and uh, give me some excitement as far as the potential of economics, and also for their book, which uh, I hope everyone has gotten on. And if you haven't, there are copies upstairs, and I'm sure that for anyone who hasn't gotten one autograph, they'd be delighted to do so. Um, in your packet, also, I'll mention that there is a flyer on the next policy forum, which is on the 31st. Uh, this one, we shift gears a little bit. We're gonna have two political theorists, uh, T. Bar McCann, who's also a fellow at Hoover, part-time, and Jan Narvison from the University of Waterloo, and they're going to be debating uh, theory of individual rights, uh, whether it relates to so-called natural rights theory or utilitarian uh, perspectives and other related things, and how that relates to many issues. Um, so I want to thank everyone for joining with us and for your questions, and look forward to seeing you again at a future policy forum.